All right, guys, we're going to get started now. So we have a Red Hat panel uh, with some uh, Juniper folks here. Um, so it's going to be more of a conversational um, presentation. But before we get started, remember, uh, come here and fill, up, you fill out your raffle tickets to win the Amazon Echo after. Um, and then we'll do the raffle. Um, and then another note, later tonight, we have the o Open Control User Group meeting at uh, Fenway Park, followed by a dinner event there. So um, I'll let you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so just uh, before we get started, if anyone has questions, this is kind of an open conversation, so if anyone uh, has anything that they want to do, just please come and use one of the two mics that are uh, on the side here. So, oh, so yeah, just a quick overview of uh, what we'll talk about today. Um, so, you know, what do we mean by uh, when we say upstream and downstream? That's going to be a pretty major component. So, a uh, show of hands, uh, who knows what upstream and downstream is if I use that terminology? Cool, so we got about half the room. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll define upstream and downstream because it'll make a lot of sense for the rest of the presentation. Uh, you know, why, why working upstream is important and uh, what the advantages of that is. Uh, why collaborating with other companies makes sense. Um, so the whole presentation is about how Red Hat and Juniper have been collaborating in an upstream uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, the benefits um, for everyone, you know, so how Red Hat and Juniper and the community and everyone gets uh, a benefit out of that, uh, that work. Um, we'll briefly uh, look at how the partnerships work. And then, uh, like I mentioned, it's basically an open discussion and we can uh, just kind of take it as we go. Uh, so, yeah. So who's talking? Go. My name is Dave Neary. I work for Red Hat on the open source and standards team uh, focused on SDN and NFE community strategy. I'm Leif Madsen. I work on the NFEPE team at Red Hat, and I'm the team lead for DevOps and uh, CI. Yeah, my name is Michael Henkel. I'm working for Juniper Contrail, and right now I'm driving the Contrail integration into Triplo. And my name is Gil Barros. Uh, I work for Red Hat in the OpenStack BU. I'm a partner product manager, uh, specifically uh, with working with Michael. Uh, so, what's upstream and downstream? You can take over. Oh, thank you. So. The, the reason we use upstream and downstream is, is kind of the water um, cycle um, a metaphor. Uh, code you can think of as starting in a developer's brain. It becomes code, which gets committed to a community repository. Uh, that community then releases that code as a, as a project, uh, and that project is used as the basis for product offerings that eventually get delivered to customers. So you can think of it as a kind of a flow from developer brain to customer data center. And that's, uh, so when we talk about the upstream uh, community, that's um, the place where the code review happens, where uh, it's the open source community where, where, the, where the code is written and, 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 uh, and developed. A downstream community is where it's consumed, right? So where it ends up, it's uh, we create products and provide solutions to customers. And, um, and that's basically it. You can. I, 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 there are a couple of other metaphors that I, that I like, but this one is, is the most well-known. Cool. Um, so just you know, before we get into kind of the nitty-gritty and, and the why, um, let's kind of look at a, a positive feedback loop and generally how this upstream and downstream dichotomy works and, and how that results in products. So you can think of this line at the top, um, it's the upstream and it's the flow. It's where you're, you have your commits going and, and it's just like kind of a continuous timeline. There's these changes from the community and they're being merged. Um, and so it just kind of keeps going um, kind of indefinitely. Um, but as a, as a product person, you, it, it's hard to maintain and to build products around that and, and provide the appropriate support for your customers. So what we want to do in a downstream model is to periodically snapshot and effectively version that. And, and so we can kind of stabilize that functionality. We know what's in there. Um, we have a little bit more control over what's going in and stuff like that. So you know, in our example here, we have version one. It's effectively a snapshot. Um, it's a commit that we take, and, and we start with that. Um, so during the downstream development, we may have some additional testing that we have specifically for, for our partners or for our customers and things like that. And, and, and an issue may be identified. So during this time cycle, um, we, we have an issue identified. Um, so what we ideally want to be doing is instead of fixing it downstream and maintaining that out of, you know, out of branch and, and having to have all the life cycle around that change, what we want to do is work with the community and land the fixes upstream. So we work with the community, we make sure that the fixes aren't providing other, um, uh, other regressions and other problems, you know, so we have a wider swath of people looking at our changes. That's kind of the advantage of having open source in general. 
So we work with the community and we land that um, fix in the upstream code first. And so now at this point, we can cherry pick that specific change back into our downstream. So we're, we have a change, but that change is not different than what is landing upstream. So that change comes into our downstream and we've now resolved our issue. And we can do that several times. So we can keep pulling these changes down to stabilize our, uh, our downstream product. And then what we can do is, you know, at some point in the future when we need to do a next version, we can create a, we can do the same thing. We can create another snapshot. The nice thing when you do it this way is that all those changes have landed upstream, all those fixes are there. I no longer, once I re-snapshot from my next version, all those changes are there. I don't have to worry about pulling them in. I don't need to rebase. I don't need to worry about merge conflicts. They're just, they're already there. They're already dealt with and away we go. So um, the positive feedback loop basically results in, you know, Red Hat and, and other companies work with, you know, this what we call an upstream first model. So that's, that's effectively what I just showed. Um, you know, all the work is done with the community upstream and any new functionality lands first in that upstream community before you pull it into the down, um, into the downstream. Bugs are found in downstream testing, you know, again, push all that up so that I don't have that kind of overhead of maintaining it going forward. Um, no forking of the code, you know, from, you know, kind of that negative connotation of forking rather than just the GitHub terminology and uh, allows, you know, for companies to stabilize the code and provide that functionality and support to their customers. And then you do that periodic snapshot from new releases. Uh, can I ask? Go yeah. to the mic. Microphone. All right. So one of the key things is when do we uh, create the downstream fork, right? What's the milestone alignment? Like, for example, OpenStack has certain milestones, right, for the releases. What time, what is the right time to basically take your downstream for, right, and start cherry picking fixes. Feature freezes or whatever be the milestone, so what's your opinion? Well, we, we get into that a little bit later, but um, typically companies would take off a release, right? Uh, now, sometimes you might, uh, for example, our Red Hat OpenStack platform, um, we try and have more of a, um, an agile development of the product, so we will have, uh, we will start downstream testing, product testing, actually earlier even than a feature freeze uh, in, the, in the OpenStack cycle so that we can get a product out. We have confidence in the product because we're testing it along the, along the way. But yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's part of how we're, do, we're doing, we're contributing early, right? I mean, we're, our engineers are working upstream, but also we start working with our, uh, um, our branch, if you will, for our, our productized version of OpenStack early and going through our QE process and that way, we may find bugs uh, sooner than after we create a product, yep. right? After after we release. So that means that a lot of those bugs that you're you're like what the dynamic that Life uh, identified, where you're finding issues and you fix them upstream, that means that you're getting those fixes right into the release that you're going to be shipping to customers, right? So you're getting them in their earlier lower cost. Um, but why do we do it? What's the importance of of working upstream? Why do we why do we bother? It seems like a lot of work. Um, so let's look at four different ways that companies typically consume uh, open source. And um, looking at the four, you can kind of think of these as I'm going along as discovering the four freedoms of free software incrementally, right? So you start by using the code, branch and modify. So you take a, a snapshot of upstream code and you just modify it to fit your needs. Um, updating regularly is realizing that you have the opportunity to distribute, um, to, to get participate in the development, right? So you're taking what comes from upstream. Contributing back, uh, you realize that, oh, I have the opportunity not just to take, but also to give. And then working upstream is the idea that you can, you can get value from collaborating. Uh, so these are the four kind of, uh, as I said, they're, they're kind of the four freedoms of, of open source. The freedom to use, uh, in, investigate how it works, um, to make modifications, and to redistribute those modifications. So looking at the first one, um, the main issue that you have when you try and branch something and modify, and this is probably the most frequent way that people take code, is, is uh, I'm developing an in-house application. Uh, this open source code over here fits my needs to 99%. I'm going to just add the feature or fix the patch or do the integration with some other piece of code that I have. Um, and then I'm, that's going to live on for the, life si for the lifetime of that project or whatever. Um, the issue that you have with this and a few people in the telecommunications industry have actually run into this, is that if you take, for example, an OpenStack Kilo, 
and you make a lot of changes to that OpenStack Kilo, um, you kind of end up getting stuck. Right? You may not be able to go to a newer version of OpenStack because your features, uh, you need them, they're tied to Kilo, and the, the cost of porting those features forward um, is prohibitive. So you end up with these, you're missing all of the benefits of this being an open source project, and one uh, commentator a few years ago called that unleveraged potential. It's all of the code, all of the security fixes, all of the bug fixes that go into the upstream, you're missing out. So you end up with a double cost. You've got the cost of the work that you do on, the, on that open source project and the opportunity cost of the, the upstream work that you're missing out on. So typically, step two, you say, well, this is free code, right? I can look at how it works. I can copy that code back into my branch. So you do a regular remerge, right? You take all of the code that's gone in between Kilo and, and uh, L. L, help me out here. Liberty. Liberty. <laughs> Liberty, the Canadian one. I win. Uh, <laughs> uh, all the code that's gone in between Kilo and Liberty, and you, you take your changes and you put them on that. And um, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a fine approach, uh, except it's not a one-off cost. You end up having to do that very regularly. And typically, as you go along, you add more and more code to your copy. So you end up diverging, and that cost of merge becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. You end up with this uh, crippling debt of maintenance over time. And so eventually, companies say, well, you know, a lot of these codes are undifferentiated heavy lifting. We've done the work. There were features that were important to us, but maybe others in the community can benefit. And so you get to this, we'd better contribute back to the community. And that's the frame that people use, is kind of using it as a, a gift culture, right? This is a gift that we're giving to the community. We're, we're donating uh, code. And um, again, this is, this is a great thing to do. It's a positive step. But it doesn't come free, right? The idea of giving code to the community so that the community will take care of the maintenance and you don't have to worry about it anymore is a flawed idea because not only have you done the work to do the feature, uh, you've had the cost of merging and keeping your code up to date, but you also have community overhead. You also have things that the community expects you to do that you wouldn't otherwise have to do. And there are many examples of this. Uh, one of them is uh, if you're developing a product, you're typically, to, to, um, to address your point earlier, you're typically going to want something that you think is fairly stable. So a standard branching mechanism in a community is you've got a stable release branch. Um, which has incremental uh, versions there, which are only fixing bugs. And then you have a development branch where all, all new development work is done. And as a vendor, you probably want to create your product off the stable release. You don't want to ship experimental code to customers. You don't want to have uh, a, a kind of the increased QE cost of, uh, of, shipping, of, of testing um, a moving target. And so you take the, the, the stable release. However, the community wants code on the tip of the trunk. They want code that's committed and rebased on master because they've already forgotten about the stable release. Well, not quite, right? But uh, um, if you were going back to two releases ago, you probably don't have anybody paying any attention to that. So if you're proposing a patch to uh, like Liberty now, it's going to rot in Garrett for months before anybody gets around to it. And, 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 and it's probably going to be rejected. And, even, it, <laughs> and it, even if you put it into that, now you've effectively put the burden on the community to, to forward port the patch right. up to master, because then. Well, you haven't, because they're going to ignore it. They're right? going the to ignore it. Not but going to do that but even if they accepted it, and you know, it just doesn't really work that way. Yeah, you'll get a minus two pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you end up with this uh, situation, which uh, is kind of what we call upstream first. You have a, a, you do your development against the master. You do, do your development against the upstream project. Uh, you merge code from the master branch onto your development branch very regularly so that you always have a clean merge from your development work onto the master. And then you get that code onto the master as soon as you can. Um, that reduces all of your merge costs. It reduces your maintenance cost over time. But then you still have the problem of, well, what do I ship to my customer? So you take, once that code is merged into the main line, you then have an opportunity to backport that, uh, that code and put it on your vendor production branch, which is the stable product that you're delivering to customers. This is what we do upstream. Right? This is, uh, we will backport uh, security fixes. We will backport bug fixes to a stable branch. They're not only put on the stable branch. They're pr primarily put on the master and then backported back. 
Uh, and so this is, this is the best way to work with open source, but it's not without problems. And I think uh, Michael here can speak to some of those problems. The first of which is that when you're building a product, particularly if you're integrating multiple open source projects, it's very, very difficult to synchronize your product planning and the upstream open source project planning. Um, release dates can be unpredictable. Uh, releases slip all the time. You can have a release of one project which is coming out in March, another project coming out in June, and you have to decide, well, do I release my product with the newer version of project one and the old version of project two, and so on. Uh, so you're kind of building a castle on quicksand. It's a moving target. You've got to figure out how to aggregate and reduce the risk of that aggregation. Um, also, it's a, it's a ton of work to get code upstream because you know the community uh, is uh, going to take time to review your patches. Um, and they might not be aligned with your goals or goals at all. So there's a risk that they may just reject your feature proposal out of hand. But yeah. Michael, maybe you can talk about some of the... Yeah, I mean, one, one thing also to mention perhaps is that if you build a commercial product out of an open source project, then you will have at some point paying customers. And those customers, they request features. Yes. And they don't care too much on what's going on with the community, what is upstream first. And so you have to somehow realign between customer feature requests and all the community processes. And that's sometimes a little bit um, hard to achieve. Right. Yeah, we spend some effort trying to uh, educate customers to the benefits of upstream first. But a lot of times, they still have deadlines, right? They, they still have production releases. They still have things that need to make them money that yep. they can't wait for, you know, like they want to see the code, they want to yeah. see it in the product. Yeah, and then in addition to that, those customers might run on a um, earlier release because it's labeled as LTS or long life or whatsoever, and they're not going to change to the latest release, so you have to backport that kind of features and patches to that LTS release because right. there's no choice. Yeah, absolutely. The, the LTS releases add um, an additional burden, right? Because we have an interest in making a release have a long term, uh, a long life um, for customers to be able to stay on a stable branch for, for a long time. But they also want, as you mentioned, oh, I, I want you to do this new thing also, but stay on my long term. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so there's some negotiation uh, to be had. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's not unusual to have up to 12 months from code being written that implements a feature to actually having that code released to having that release integrated into another project that depends on it, to having that code delivered to customers. So yeah, it's, it's, there are difficulties, definitely, with the upstream first approach. And one of, uh, we, were, we were saying uh, before the session started that one of the things that you have to do a lot is, is actually just you know, say no to backporting features. And so we have, we have people who, you know, they're, that's, that's basically their default response, and that's their job, is to ensure that we don't take on an undue maintenance burden unless there is a really good business case for it. And that brings us to the really good business case and building <laughs> partnerships. Could I ask a question before of course. you go into that? So um, what you said, Dave, makes a lot of sense. Question is, is there ever a time when, say, you know, there's a bug that gets found and you know, we, fought, we, we have a fix, and based on what you said, we put it up in the upstream first, and then bring it down to the product. Question is, you know, how long does that usually take, and has there ever been a time when it takes too long, and we might make an exception because the customer needs the bug fix immediately, you put it downstream first, and then do it upstream. Has that ever happened? Well, Gil is the product manager in the room. <laughs> I'm going to defer to him on that. Um, yes. You want more details, I assume. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. So uh, I think security fixes are actually a good example there, right? I mean, the uh, security fixes are very important, and we want to ensure that the shipping stable product uh, does not have vulnerabilities that um, would affect customers. Um, the community will find issues, will find problems, they'll, they'll do the work upstream, but a lot of times, because of our investment uh, in these communities, the people working on these fixes upstream are either Red Hat employees or Juniper employees, or, or basically the people who are working you know, on, on the productized version. So a, a lot of times the development is concurrent, where we, you know, we, we know how to fix this, we've had the communications about how to fix this, so we're working both sides. And as you said, yes, sometimes uh, 
assuming we, we, we don't break any embargo dates, um, you know, the, the releases will happen on the same day, um, you know, almost immediately, right? I, mean, the, I mentioned embargoes. Uh, a, a lot of times the security community will um, give ourselves or themselves a certain amount of time to fix a bug or to fix a security fix before it becomes public. You know, we, we, the, say uh, Apache has discovered a uh, vulnerability um, and it's not a publicly, you know, noticed vulnerability. So instead of immediately going out and publishing it, they they will communicate with the the key players and say, uh, we just found we just found this. We need to find a fix. Uh, let's say, uh, give ourselves two days to fix this, and then we will announce the the vulnerability and the fix at the same time. Um, that makes it safer for customers. Uh, because there is a smaller breadth of people who know about a vulnerability, um, and it makes it so that we release the, the fix at the same time. Um, but for bug fixes, yes, sometimes uh, we will be working upstream, but a customer needs it yesterday, right? Because there's a system that's down and it's costing them money. So we'll give them an early release, a hot fix or something like that, so that they fix their problem, um, you know, with the understanding that the fix that fixes your problem this way may not be the fix that actually lands upstream, and we will work with you to make sure that, you know, the, the, the upstream landed fix, if it is different for some reason, um, also, you know, solves your problem, and you can migrate to that easily. Yeah, because you're not always going to have the, the engineers who are working upstream in those particular projects where you submit the issues. They, they don't have any timelines or constraints in order to get something merged in. So it can, it can take some time, and especially if you're not fully engaged in that particular community and they maybe don't know you quite as well, maybe it, it becomes slightly less prioritized or maybe they, they really want to spend a lot more time reviewing the code and making sure that um, the, the changes really match the style of the project and so you can have some of that delay and back and forth. So yeah, I mean it makes sense you're going to end up with a hot fix potentially um, pulled into your downstream in order to get you know the problem so that your customer isn't basically you know increasing support and stuff like that. But um, what you'll have to do is make sure you're tracking that change in your downstream so that when the upstream change gets merged, if it is different, that you effectively roll back that that hot fix and and pull the the actual change down so you're not you're not diverging. Okay, um, building partnerships. Uh, so a, a big part of making this community work is that there are multiple groups of people working on different projects, different products, and we want to make sure that we're providing a solution that's interesting to customers, right? I mean, if, if what we're providing is not interesting to customers, well, you know, it's a nice academic uh, achievement, but, you know, it's not going to uh, put food on anybody's table. Um, so when we worked with uh, Juniper, uh, Juniper in particular, um, we had specific targets. Uh, in, in this case, it was we wanted to do an integration of Juniper Contrail uh, with OpenStack. Um, and it was uh, more of a stretch uh, goal than we've uh, in, in the past done with a lot of other uh, SDN integrations, where we wanted to deploy, fully deploy uh, Contrail um, not just the, the compute and not just the client, but also the, the backplane. Um, so there was a lot of sort of understanding what the partner requirements, understanding what customer requirements were, um, working with uh, Juniper to figure out how we were going to fit these in, in our roadmaps, right? I mean, we, we were talking about multiple different roadmaps, um, and it, it, it's an interesting challenge. Um, and I think a big part of it is. Uh, learning how we each work, right? I mean, OpenStack, uh, Red Hat has been doing the upstream first uh, model for over a decade, two decades, um, a very long time. Um, and that's uh, not necessarily what everybody does. So it, it was an interesting, um, I think, learning experience for both of it, us. It was a learning curve for Juniper quite a lot because, I mean, Contrail is an open source product. However, it does not have the same level of community as OpenStack, for example. And um, although development is a little bit different to what's happening in OpenStack, so when we started, and it's totally separate from, um, from OpenStack, so there are only very few integration points like the Neutron plugin, like a Nova Vift driver. Mm -hmm. So that's where we paid attention to what's going on um, upstream. 
But now all of a sudden that we started to integrate with um, Triple O, we had much, uh, much more touch points. So we had to look into how is the community working, how is upstream working. And that's where Gil provided a lot of help introducing us into um, that new way of working. And it was quite an experience, a very pleasant experience. I really enjoyed it so far. Um, and it's, I mean, there's a lot of benefit because um, working upstream, having such a big community is uh, spreading the word for the product. You, people are looking to, through, through the source code and see, okay, there's a new SDN product. It's, mm -hmm. it's part of um, upstream. We can deploy it. And, and they're contributing to it also, right? I mean, yes. as, as you're, you're, you're putting code up there, you're having multiple eyes look at it. Absolutely. And these people who don't work for Juniper are making recommendations and suggestions yep. on how to implement something differently, an improvement. Or it's, it's some kind of reputation. I mean, if you can say, okay, uh, my integration is upstream, that means it's not a point solution. It's something which has been validated, which has been reviewed by a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's finally good for the product itself. It is. An interesting anecdote from, from when we were starting working together. Uh, Michael was uh, one of our main touch points on the engineering side, um, on the solution side. and. Uh, I, I, I had managed to convince Michael that he doesn't need, you know, a, a person to call in engineering at Red Hat, right? That he should just go to IRC, just like go to pound triple O and someone will answer your question, right? You, you, you don't need a phone number, right? And, and, and Michael got it, right? He was, he was submitting code, he was asking questions, he was, and uh, we're, we're on a call, we have uh, joint engineering calls and uh, one of his peers from a different, from a different department um, was hammering me on like no like I need I need an engineering contact at Red Hat because I have I have questions I have questions. and I and, and I was about to say you really need to go to IRC right like you really need to go to, to pound triple O and before I got the word out Michael said it <laughs> and like I felt vindicated you know it's like, <laughs> like it, it's fi we finally gotten here so. yeah I mean if you want to play upstream you you have to right. use uh, the process which are in place and I mean as I said it, it was really the first project for, for Juniper where we contributed that much to upstream. Mm -hmm. We really started to work upstream and it's a learning curve. I mean, you need to introduce people to the thought that there is a community of people you can go to and you don't have individual contacts. I mean, if things go wrong and you need really urgent help, you still have the opportunity to course, yeah. get in touch with a single person and they are all very kind. They offer remote desktop sessions to go mm -hmm. with you through the code. and. I mean, that's not being ruled out, but the general rule is go to IRC, you have 20 right. people looking to your question, and eventually Absolutely. one will answer. Uh -huh. You really want to get engaged and, and work with those people and kind of show that you, know, you have some knowledge and you're, trying, you're actually trying, and, and the, type, the way you phrase your questions as opposed to like demanding, <laughs> demanding something from them, they, they really don't need to give you anything. Exactly. So you really got to think of them as, you know, they're, they're people, they're, they're not your vendor, they're not someone you're giving money to where you can demand anything. You really got to work with them like, like friends and, and really try to engage and, and, and show that you're trying. You yep. know, a lot of the time, just showing that you're trying, even if you don't get it, people are so much more willing to work with you. Um, just that you just want to get in there, you want to learn, and you're taking feedback um, you know, positively, and you're giving back positively. That makes a huge difference. And at the end of the day, I mean, you can really tell that you did a decent job if you're invited for reviews for totally different projects. I mean, this Absolutely. is really giving you some very positive feedback mm -hmm. when people are adding you to the reviewer list. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so we've covered most <laughs> most of this in, in the conversation, but um, so what, what we get out of this is every, everybody has a, has a benefit, right? Like the, the the community gets new code, gets new functionality that's interesting and beneficial to them. Um, Juniper gets additional people to look at their code and provide recommendations and, and possible bug fixes and or, or whatever. Um, and we both get a solution, or actually all of us get a solution that you know provides additional functionality for our customers. So, as we said in the beginning, it's an open forum. You know, we're interested in, in hearing your questions and your thoughts. Um, be it on uh, this or on any of our random. Uh... <laughs> okay, um, I have a quick question. So partnership is a good thing. I mean, I've been part of this and it's been really great working with you guys. Um, how do you, uh, uh, when there are multiple parties involved, like we have a customer, we have partners and all this, how do you make sure 
um, the customer sees a smooth experience that people are working together. They're not hacking, but actually integrating and stuff like that. Any suggestions on what's the right way to jointly develop so that the customer? It's a good gets question because community is messy, right? Community is humans. So, Human relationships are messy, and uh, you know sometimes people have arguments in public forums in in uh, the community, and that's a healthy process. Uh, but I think part of it is is educating customers about this is, you know. What you're seeing now is not unusual in the industry. It's just you're seeing it, and normally you wouldn't. Um, so I think that, that that's part of creating relationships. And that's one of the things that uh, um, Gil didn't say is um, you know, we're, one of the things that we bring to the table is we're in a lot of these communities, and we can help you form those relationships. So maybe make a smoother experience, right. have less conflict coming into it, because you, you understand the culture of these communities before you come in there. Um, and that, that helps. Uh, but uh, I think part of it is also, you know, understanding that your customer is also going to be there. Uh, maybe not the C-level people that you're selling to, uh, but the engineers that are also deploying and, and, and testing and, and, and using the code. And so, um, you know, it also gives us an opportunity, and this is something we didn't talk about, uh, to have beyond the vendor relationship, it gives you an opportunity to have a much deeper, more technical uh, relationship with the actual people who are going to be operating your code in production. Absolutely. I mean, we, we see with some of our uh, advanced customers that they're also contributing in these communities. So when they see us um, working together on something, they may, may make a recommendation uh, based on, you know, like the, these are use cases that we have, so we'd like to see it work like this. But I, I know what you mean. There's, there can be a lot of uh, strife when uh, customers see what seems like a hack, but really is a workshop. Um, yeah, I had to slip that in, uh, in inside uh, inside joke. Um, but uh, I, I think communication is a big part of uh, making that work. Is ensuring that customers are aware of um, sort of the, the different timelines for the functionality that they're looking for. If they're looking for future functionality in in a, in a solution that we're working on together. Um, making sure that they're aware of the timelines, making sure that they're aware of uh, the different features that we're working on and the progress of that. Um, but some customers don't care about any of that, right? Some customers just want a product at the end of the thing, at the end of the day. day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, they don't want to hear about how the community is doing and how they're helping us. And in that case, we can, you know, we're happy to work with them you know, in the, in the, call it the old communication model, where we tell them, you know, when we expect a release to happen and that it's progressing great and here's the beta. Since we have more time, I might as well ask another question. <laughs> um, so with, with Red Hat, obviously, all of our products are open source, um, upstream first. Almost all. Uh, all of them, yeah. Well, well, most that, of them. That's the target, right? Yeah. Now, with, uh, with Juniper, obviously, open contrail is open source. Is there any difference in terms of how we at Red Hat do things versus uh, open contrail in terms of, maybe this is really a question more for Michael, uh, you know, Dave and the team kind of went through kind of the way the Red Hat does the upstream first. Mm -hmm. Is the Juniper um, open contrail similar? Well, um, I mean, the, the biggest difference I think we can point out when we compare OpenStack with OpenContrail, for example, because OpenStack is mainly community-driven. OpenContrail also has a community which is much smaller because it's a much more point solution. It's an SDN controller, whereas OpenStack is much bigger. It's many projects, many really put people together, put together. looking into it. Um, so right now, the development of OpenContrail is mainly influenced by Juniper and by customer requests. Whereas everything which goes into upstream in OpenStack comes from people who are contributing code to it. And that's, I think, the biggest difference right now. And yeah. I mean, one of the things that uh, myself and, and Red Hat, as, as a partner person, um, I'm interested in helping um, our partners sort of enhance their communities and, and, and have more contributions from the outside and, and, and not just internal contributions. Um, and in contributions from Red Hat, right? I mean, if you if you go look at the um, Open Contrail Contrail uh, Git repos, you'll see quite a few Red Hat people who have started to 
contribute code in there. I mean, it, it, in this case, it's usually code re related to integration. It's triple O code, yes. Triple o it's code. not going into the core product. Right. Yet. But uh, you know, the idea is we, you know, we all benefit, um, as we mentioned, from forming a community around, around these products. Just to add to that, a couple of quick things, Ali. Um, um, so um, from how we are doing upstreaming versus downstreaming, it's pretty much standard practice like what Red had, uh, what they talked about uh, with the branching process, et cetera. Um, and that's one. And um, the second thing is Randy talked today at the keynote about what our approach to open source and community development is and how we are going forward, going to make it a much more broader community and how we are going to facilitate that. So that's where we are actually um, looking to partners like Red Hat who have a lot of experience to uh, help us uh, get to that goal of making it a much more diverse and broader community. And I would, I, I mean, I would point are. out that it, it's, I'm, that's the norm for most projects that come from a, a company is that the company remains for, for quite some time uh, uh, the dominant uh, developer. Uh, open source developer communities grow from user communities, either because when you get enough users, other vendors start to pay attention, or because uh, your users are also um, technical, be become tech technical contributors to solve problems that they have themselves. So um, it's not by any means unusual. Yeah, I would say, like, I mean, really at the end of the day, larger projects typically exist and are being built for the purposes of being productized. So, I mean, that's not an uncommon thing. I mean, even like that's what Red Hat does, that's what Juniper does, that's what lots of people do. So, I mean, when you have a project that was started by a particular company, it being the primary contributor, like you said, is really not an uncommon or even a necessarily a bad thing. It's, it is what it is. Maybe a bit naive question from me. <laughs> One of your slides looks uh, like uh, Juniper and Red Hat are announcing their partnership. Does Open Contrail, uh, will Open Contrail make its way into Red Hat portfolio? I know you use it in Red Hat uh, OpenStack already. Uh, anything beyond it? Or could you give the details maybe on <laughs> how this partnership will? Well, I mean, right now, um, what you can do, as we said, Open Control is a pure open source product. So you can go to opencontrail.org or to the GitHub repositories. You can um, pull the code. You can uh, package your RPMs. Then you can use um, the triple O heat templates we contributed and start a deployment on, let's say, CentOS, for example. But right now, um, you have to do the, uh, the packaging effort. You have to compile it. So right now, Juniper does not provide um, RPMs. And that's what DP was talking about just before where um, Randy, this morning in the keynote at the Open Source Day, announced um, that we are going to realign a little bit on how we are handling um, contribution of, let's say, packets to make it easier to consume Open Control for users. And I will point out, represent OPNFE. Um, so there's uh, Stuart Mackey is uh, a Juniper uh, engineer who is working in OPNFE to um, enable the integration of Open Contrail um, with multiple uh, installers, and um, that would be where I would uh, expect to see any integration work uh, happen. Um, it's, I don't believe it's on the roadmap for the AP, roadmap, roadmap for the Apex project at this point. Uh, for the Euphrates release, but that is not locked and loaded yet. Uh, so that would, I'm, I'm, that will be where you would, where I would expect to see it happen. Be an OPNF. I mean, that's again something where we are pretty much customer driven. So customer request was to be well integrated with OSP10 and RHEL, and that's what we have done now. So that integration has has been done, and now there is some time to contribute something back and then make it easier for the community to consume everything we have done for RHEL. I think that takes us to the end of our, unless you have a very quick question. Yeah, no, I was just going to really just make a quick comment. He, he asked about the partnership. So today we obviously have joined customers together. That wasn't really mentioned, you know, like Orange in the UK and a, and a few customers together. So they, they get in the Juniper Contrail and then they get the uh, Red Hat OpenStack from Red Hat and the two products all work together. So that's the partnership we have right now outside of the uh, open source uh, conversation that you've heard here. 
So yeah, if we didn't answer your question or you didn't want to ask it publicly, um, I'm sure we'll be around and uh, that's uh, it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.